Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 298 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Kovart. The United States is a nation that develops and exports a lot of different products and ideas. For example, today the U.S. exports computers and electronics, as well as internet and cloud-based technologies. In years past, the United States was a powerhouse when it came to producing steel, coal, cars, and textiles. Have you ever stopped to think about how the United States became a manufacturing nation? How it developed not just products, but the technologies, knowledge, and machinery necessary to manufacture and produce those products? One person who has stopped to think about and research these questions is Lindsay Schackenbach Regula, an associate professor of history at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and the author of Manufacturing Advantage, War, the State, and the Origins of American Industry, 1776 to 1848. And today, Lindsay joins us to investigate the origins of industrialization in the early United States. Now, during our exploration, Lindsay reveals why the young United States viewed manufacturing as an issue of national security and why it wanted to establish factories during the 1790s. Information about the investment of knowledge and capital required to start a factory in the early United States. And details about the United States' earliest manufacturing industries, textiles, and firearms. But first, the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter is a great way to stay up to date with this podcast. Every time a new episode publishes, the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter places the show notes for that episode right in your inbox. And anytime I have something new and exciting to share with you, I use the email newsletter to send you a short note. Now, signing up for the email newsletter is quick and easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. All right, are you ready for your tour of early American factories and manufacturing? Allow me to introduce you to our knowledgeable guide. Joining us is an associate professor of history at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Her expertise is in the histories of capitalism and the early American Republic. She's written numerous articles on these topics, and she's written a book, Manufacturing Advantage, War, the State, and the Origins of American Industry, 1776 to 1848. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Lindsay Schackenbach Regula. Thanks so much for having me, Liz. Lindsay, in your book, Manufacturing Advantage, you reveal how the young United States government spurred industry and manufacturing after the war for independence. Now, I think we can agree that there was a lot of work that the young nation needed to undertake after securing independence. So why was manufacturing something of a priority that needed to be encouraged? And how did Americans acquire their manufactured goods before and during the war for independence? So most simply, manufacturing needed to be promoted because national security depended on it. So the new nation faced a whole host of threats to its survival, including tax rebellions, Indian warfare, and conflict with France and England and Spain. And all they really had were a bunch of British hand-me-downs from the Seven Years' War and old French firearms that had been purchased on loan. And then for textiles, so even if military efficacy did not depend on textiles per se, the Republican experiment did. So commercial dependence of all kinds were anathema to Republican success. Textiles, so yarn, thread, broadcloths, and eventually ready-made clothing were visible forms of dependence or independence. And President George Washington recognized this when he addressed Congress wearing Connecticut-made broadcloth. And in fact, Britain was less concerned about Americans copying, say, their copper-making technology than they were about textiles, which suggests the importance of textiles for some form of security. 
So following the war, right, firearms offered the promise of physical safety while textiles provided a subtler form of security as visible and tactile manifestations of independence. So before the war, yes, colonists had some industry. Craft industries had existed from the earliest days of colonization, and many Americans produced goods in their homes. But in general, they were supposed to purchase manufactured goods. So those are goods that have been processed in any way. And this includes both final products like a whole musket and intermediate products like cloth that will then be used to make a dress. They were supposed to purchase these from Britain. And again, they mostly had household production and some small craft industry. There were some industries that Britain did encourage, like shipbuilding, which became the largest industry in the colonies in New England, and then cloth weaving, cloth sewing, leather tanning, shoemaking, furniture making, and tool making were other kind of small-scale industries that exist. And some colonies did pass legislation to promote tanneries and the manufacture of cotton, woolens, and linens. The metal trades flourished in Connecticut and Rhode Island and paper making, shoe making, distilling, shipbuilding had taken off in all four New England colonies by the eve of the revolution. And they also had small craft gun industries in Pennsylvania and in the kind of Kentucky area. But in general, the rule was colonists were supposed to purchase manufactured goods from Great Britain and the industry that did exist was small scale until following the revolution when there was this kind of government initiative to promote it in the context of national security. It's interesting to think about manufactured goods as being necessary for national security and independence. And to go back to your point about physical security, I think when we think of manufactured goods, we think of, you know, dishes, clocks, cloth, domestic items that people would consume on a regular basis. But it seems if we're focusing on the primary interest of the early United States government in promoting manufacturing, we're really looking at weapons, weapons for physical security to defend itself and cloth, which, you know, you could turn into military uniforms. Yeah, definitely. But again, for the case of textiles, I argue that while they're not always linked explicitly to military production, so certainly manufactured canvas was then used to make tents and military uniforms, but the average, say, consumer broadcloth that would then be used to make either clothing or blankets, sheets for the house, those were linked to national security to the extent that they were forms of, again, that kind of tactile and visible independence or dependence, however, maybe if it's imported, then it's showing this kind of dependence on Great Britain, which becomes to be seen as a threat to security. Again, not necessarily always linked to military goods, but again, the notion of promoting the Republican experiment by way of processed goods. So it sounds like after the revolution, the United States was pretty keen on establishing its own domestic manufacturing, that the young nation really saw manufacturing as vital to helping the United States function and to remain an independent nation. So Lindsay, could you tell us a bit about how the young nation became so eager to produce its own goods? Yeah, so Quite simply, difficulties providing clothing and weapons during the war for soldiers highlighted the need for some form of domestic military industrial capabilities. So during the war, American troops received much of their munitions from the smuggling network that connected France and the Netherlands to the North American coast via the Dutch West Indies. Additionally, the French government funneled military supplies to the Continental Army by loaning money to French trading companies that would sell them to Americans on credit. And then throughout the war, George Washington is writing letters to the Continental Congress, state governments, and his military subordinates that stress the consequences of insufficient arms and especially clothing supplies. He, you know, writes that they really need clothing and blankets. He said that the army was struggling to even mend the clothing it had for, quote, want of thread. And toward the end of the war, he's still waiting on clothing imports from France and complaining about the fact that soldiers, especially those from the South, were literally naked. 
And so, again, that is to some extent forming policymakers following the revolution, you know, informing their kind of ideas about what should be done to promote the Republican experiment following the war. But yet at the same time, a sort of kind of historical amnesia sets in among policymakers as Americans did welcome the resumption of imports primarily from the British Empire. So this process by which the government starts promoting manufacturing, it's an ad hoc process and it's a halting process and it takes a while to develop. But again, that revolutionary experience does inform at least leaders' ideas about what the proper relationship is between government and industry following the war, because there is that sense that if the United States is to go to war again, we could have these kind of recurring supply nightmares that had existed during the war for independence. So are we hearing that there were perhaps two advantages the government saw in having American-based manufacturing, you know, one being a close proximity to the goods, that there wouldn't be this heavy need to import from Europe or elsewhere. And the second advantage being cost, that the production of goods in the United States would ultimately make these goods not just easier to acquire, but cheaper for Americans to acquire as well. Yeah, so that I think is informing their decision. Although at first cost, that's part of the reason that especially textile manufacturing doesn't take off right away is because it is still cheaper for the consumer to purchase better quality goods from abroad than it is to make them themselves because Americans are struggling to match the quality and to succeed, they need protective tariffs and then that makes goods more expensive. And so the cost issue, it is more feasible for the average person to purchase foreign goods at first. In terms of the arms industry, there is the idea of, of course, that it's more convenient and eventually will be more cost effective to have all this done domestically. But it's also expensive to start up an industrial scale gun manufacturing. And that's why government capital is needed to kind of get the ball rolling for gun manufacturing in the United States. Yeah, I think we need to talk about capital investment and knowledge investment when it comes to these early United States factories, because establishing a factory doesn't just require a huge capital investment, you know, to buy the building, build the building, find the land and the space, but also the equipment that is involved. Building a factory also requires a ton of knowledge investment as well. So how did the young United States, which was debt ridden thanks to the war for independence, how did it come up with the capital to develop textile and firearm factories? And Where did it plan to get the knowledge that Americans needed to establish these factories? For the arms industry, they come to rely on the private contractor. So first, I should say that the federal government establishes two federal armories in Springfield, Massachusetts and Harpers Ferry, Virginia. And then it relies on contracts with private manufacturers to kind of supplement the output of these two federal armories. And it relies on, in the case especially of the Springfield Armory in Western Massachusetts, on the kind of metalworking trades that existed in there and the knowledge of those producers. And many of those private contractors had no experience making firearms. But again, there was already that kind of skill base for working with metal. And so they relied on them. And Eli Whitney, who, you know, is famous for allegedly inventing the cotton gin, He convinces without ever having produced a gun, he convinces federal officials that he will be able to kind of parlay his skills into gun manufacturing, is able to secure a contract that way. So they're relying on networks of knowledge that already existed in that sense. And then for textiles, there's no official plan for establishing a textile industry. The textile industry more benefits from protective tariffs, but even more than that, less direct forms of federal assistance in the forms of eventually diplomacy and things like that, that the government's able to do. So it's not as if there are federal officials saying, okay, we know that there's a certain group of people that has excellent skills in manufacturing and we're going to, you know, employ them to make the textiles. It's a more ad hoc process. Now, in terms of military production of textiles, they are 
for example, sending supplies to Philadelphia to be finished by seamstresses there. So depending on the skills that exist in that way. But again, there's less of an exact calculated plan about how to get this knowledge put to use for textile manufacturing. A couple of times you've mentioned the idea that in order to get textile manufacturing started in the United States, the government really needed to employ protective tariffs. What is a protective tariff and how would these tariffs have protected and promoted the establishment of factories in the early United States? Yeah, so protective tariffs are duties placed on goods that are imported. And so aspiring manufacturers were requesting these kind of protections to be placed on imports in all sorts of different goods. And one of them is textiles. Now, economic historians have debated the extent to which these actually made a difference in production and whether manufacturing would have developed without them. And in general, the kind of significance of these tariffs doesn't really take off until the 18-teens. One of the first major tariffs on textiles is 1816. But beginning with the first Congress, there are duties placed on goods and there's all sorts of debates about you know the level of them. And in general, merchants don't like these as much because that, of course, raises their costs from importing and kind of cuts into the profit they can make from selling international goods in the domestic market. This causes lots of political debate. But again, the idea is that by making it more expensive for consumers to purchase British goods, they will inspire people or force them, coerce them in some way to purchase domestically. Now, we've been talking about manufacturing broadly. You know, we've talked about factories in general terms and how they got started. But Lindsay, could you take us inside an early American factory? Who would have worked in these early factories? What kind of machineries would we be looking at? And also, where did the United States government intend to see the first American manufacturers, especially for textiles, develop? I mean, what cities and towns would have housed these early factories? For the arms industry, it took capital and on the scale that the government needed, it required machinery. So making guns requires casting metal into small parts and then stamping to bend parts into shape. And this had been done by hand using blacksmith techniques in the colonial era. And it was still practiced by kind of skilled gunsmiths. But Again, as the federal government establishes federal armories and begins contracting with private manufacturers, it's increasingly done with machine cutters. And over the course of the early 19th century, there's greater specialization in these machine processes so that the laborer is now responsible for, you know, increasingly kind of small tasks within the larger system of creating a gun. So whereas the individual gunsmith, it would take a long time to kind of make the gun from start to finish. With government investment, it's possible to, again, employ more and more labor and to have the individual responsible for only one small part of the process. And these laborers, while at first they might be employed for the skill that they can supply, increasingly they are less skilled workers, people that basically, in cases there's, you know, letters of individuals writing to the superintendent of Springfield Armory, for example, requesting work saying, you know, I'm struggling to provide for my family, please, you know, give me a job. So again, people that are kind of down on their luck. And then in the case of textiles, textile factories are less expensive to operate. And It varied greatly whether, you know, it would be started by, say, a couple individuals and they'd issue shares and would be capitalized at, say, 5,000 versus the group of guys that are known as the Boston Associates that start the mills at Lowell. Their factories are capitalized much higher. They issue more expensive shares of stock and they end up having all processes from start to finish of a good being made on site, whereas somebody like Samuel Slater opening mills in the 1790s, only part of the good is produced in the factory and then they output portions of the labor to surrounding households. So 
they might do spinning on site and then send cloth out to households to be sewn together. Now, if we think about government contracts today, whether it's a contract to build a military base or other types of weapons or tools or infrastructure, we know that the decision of who is going to get that contract is a political one. So when it came to granting contracts to establish factories in the early American Republic, were these decisions also political? Did you have cities and towns vying to get contracts to establish a firearms factory or a textile factory? And if these were political decisions, how did the government sort through the politics in order to grant the contracts? So the choice for the two federal armories at Springfield and Harper's Ferry, that decision gets made by George Washington as president. And the decision for both of those is, so Springfield, there was already a federal arsenal there. It is strategically advantageous because it's both located in a waterway and has a good access to water power, but it's also inland enough so that it doesn't have the threat of foreign invasion. Similar case with Harper's Ferry. Also, some have argued that Washington just was generally interested in kind of economically developing that whole kind of Potomac Valley and so therefore chose that site for the armory. And then throughout the first decades of the 19th century, there are kind of proposals to establish a third federal armory to the West to both appeal to Western settlers and that you see people writing into Congress where there's definitely that kind of, yes, like lobbying to get this different location open. So for the case of the two federal armories, there's not much in the way of kind of the voting constituency getting to have a say in whether the factory gets opened or not. In the case of textiles, that is the decision of the individual who decides to open a factory. There are, of course, always complaints coming from people in the surrounding community that might, for example, have damages done to their farm or have some kind of negative consequences once a mill opens and, you know, there's changes to what's happening along that specific river. So that can cause all sorts of tension in that way. One of the first kind of major manufacturing initiatives gets started with the sponsorship of Alexander Hamilton and Tench Cox, and they have this planned kind of private public factory undertaking in Patterson, New Jersey, and that benefits from both private investment, state tax breaks from New Jersey, and just the kind of general government support. It doesn't actually do all that well. And so that encourages many people to say, oh, we'll see, this is what happens when the government tries to get involved. And so following that point, a lot of the kind of support for textiles comes in more subtler forms and less direct forms of federal assistance. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And it really sounds like those two initial armories in Springfield, Massachusetts and Harpers Ferry, Virginia, were really placed there more for strategic value and perhaps the value of enhancing Washington's pocketbook in terms of the Potomac Valley. But they were there for strategic value more than they were there for political considerations. Although, like I said, that idea for a third site that definitely kind of entered in political calculations, definitely entered in that and kind of, again, appealing to Western interests and people petitioning to have that kind of economic stimulus benefit their community. But again, the early decision for Harper's Ferry in Springfield, that was a decision that George Washington was able to make as the first president at Congress had given him that responsibility. Since we're speaking about the armories at Springfield and Harper's Ferry, Joanne wonders about the process of manufacturing weapons and whether there was any difference in how weapons were manufactured between the Springfield and Harper's Ferry armories. So did geographic location play any role at all in how armaments were produced? It did to some extent. So there were differences in the production of firearms at Springfield and at Harper's Ferry. And part of that is at least according to historian of technology, Merritt Rose Smith wrote the really key works on Harper's Ferry. And he shows that there was a kind of different, almost a different cultural logic to firearms production. There was more resistance on the part of 
workers and superintendents to have federal oversight and that in general, the quality and quantity of firearms produced in Harper's Ferry was inferior to that of the Springfield Armory. So there were definitely differences. But again, some of that is both geographical and also cultural in some way. Now, although your book, Manufacturing Advantage, doesn't exactly focus on the Harpers Ferry Armory, it does spend a good bit of time covering the Springfield Armory. And Tumic is interested in more details about the establishment of the Springfield Armory and in its development of interchangeable weapon parts. So, Lindsay, could you tell us more about the Springfield Armory and interchangeable weapon parts? Yes. So the Springfield Armory does become associated with kind of key technological innovations and with interchangeable production. Now, interchangeable production, which basically means that any one part can be substituted for another, that is a kind of long and uneven process that is attributed to different individuals, one of whom is Eli Whitney. Others are gun contractors, Simeon North, John Hall, and then the production that's being done at the Springfield Armory. So it's a kind of cumulative process of all these different people kind of working toward it. But basically, following the War of 1812, and by the War of 1812, the United States is able to be completely self-sufficient in supplying its own weapons because of the success of the federal armories and the beginnings of the contract system. But there were still concerns about the standardization of weapons, about things needing to be repaired and the struggles to do that. And so following the War of 1812, there's ordnance officers like this guy, Decius Wadsworth, and he's saying, okay, we need to really improve manufacturers' ability to match the kind of standards that we supply. And so there's more effective kind of inspection and proofing done at individuals' factories. And then there's more machinery introduced into the Springfield Armory that eventually allows the United States to have interchangeable production in the firearms industry by the 1840s. And then that process spreads to other industries like sewing machines and eventually automobiles. And it's pioneered, again, largely at the Springfield Armory and in the factories of private contractors. But it becomes, again, more associated with Springfield than it does with Harper's Ferry, because in general, that is seen as the kind of main site for innovation. And then what the government will do is send down various mechanics and such to work in Harper's Ferry or to observe. And so there's that shared knowledge network that's influencing that. And then the contractors that are all within the vicinity of the Springfield Armory, they share an inspector usually. And so again, there's this kind of transfer of knowledge and processes from factory to factory that the government really takes advantage of. This is really interesting. Could you tell us more about this shared system of knowledge? What exactly was the interplay or relationship between these inspectors and contractors and the different factories you've been talking about? Right. The contractors would have these agreements that they would produce a specific amount of arms within, usually it would be over like a five-year period, and they'd get often advance some that served as kind of loans to enable them to either, you know, purchase additional machinery or employ labor, whatever. And so they would then write to the superintendent of the Springfield Armory. And they'd say, okay, I now have 2000 stands of muskets ready to be inspected. And then the inspector would be dispatched to that local factory to make sure that the firearms at that man produced met government standards. And then any that did not would oftentimes either sold locally to an auction house or discarded in some ways, but they had to meet these standards. And so again, by having people travel around, some of that knowledge gets shared. Or when an individual mechanic does kind of improve a process, that person might be sent around to other factories or the Springfield Armory might send an individual to observe something at a contractor's factory and then employ that process at the Federal Armory. So again, this kind of sharing that happens in that process. 
So when we're talking about contractors in early American factories, what we're really talking about are people who own or operate a smaller factory that are also producing something that these bigger government factories like the Springfield Armory need. Yeah. So as a result of there's a militia act passed in the Becomes Law in 1808. And that is when the federal government assumes responsibility for helping state governments supply their state militia with guns provided by the federal government. However, because of this kind of longstanding fear of too much centralized control, the weapons for the state militia cannot come from the actual federal armories themselves. They have to come from a private factory. So the government enters into contracts with these private manufacturers, including, again, like Eli Whitney. And then those weapons are inspected by somebody employed by the federal armory. But because the weapons come from an actual factory of a private producer, they're in compliance with this militia act. And so then a certain amount of weapons are then doled out to the individual states to then supply to their militia. So I think we should turn now to the other half of the United States' early manufacturing goals, which is textile manufacturing. They want to make domestic textiles. Now, since this is a natural break point in our conversation, why don't we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, and then we can turn our full attentions to textiles. Our investigation of early American manufacturing is brought to you by News of the World, a film by Universal Pictures. Academy Award winner Tom Hanks stars in the cinematic adventure News of the World, which is now available to own for the first time on Digital Now and on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD. Certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, News of the World is a critically acclaimed story that's set five years after the Civil War. News of the World offers a story of Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd, a nonfiction storyteller who moves from town to town, sharing news from far reaches of the world. Now, as he journeys across the plains of Texas, Kidd, who is played by Tom Hanks, crosses paths with a 10-year-old girl who was taken in by the Kiwa people six years before and raised as one of their own. Now, Kidd agrees to deliver the child, played by actress Helena Zengel, to where the law says she belongs. But as Kidd and the child travel hundreds of miles in search of a place to call home, they face numerous challenges posed by both human and natural forces. Interested in why Entertainment Weekly calls News of the World a classic true grit western? Here's a clip from the movie. Film is a mysterious discovery. Who are you? Do you have a name? I like to give actors the maximum freedom. Paul wanted the storytelling to carry the weight of the moment. You've got to be listening to what the film itself wants to be. You can certainly handle a horse. It's so incredibly emotional because you live the physicality of the journey. We were never on a stage. You're not really faking anything. That's just a gift. It ended up just being that magic of modern day movie making. The little girl is lost. You can't have her! And I'm taking her home! If you're in the mood for a film that Deadline calls a towering piece of movie making, be sure to check out News of the World, available now on digital and in 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD. Lindsay, let's talk textiles. Marie wonders if you could tell us about textile manufacturing. Specifically, Marie wonders what it took to manufacture textiles and why textile manufacturing seems to have become so big in New England and New York City, and yet not big in other parts of the young nation. New York and New England developed industry for different reasons. New York had manufactured iron products for Britain during the colonial era, and it also had a long history of craft industry. So again, these kind of small-scale establishments run by master artisans where things were mostly made by hand. And these included shoes, boots, hats, clocks, other goods like that. And then following the revolution, societies formed there to advocate for more protectionist policies to, again, kind of induce consumers to 
purchase domestic textiles. And the New York State Legislature also aided entrepreneurs by passing protective tariffs before the first Congress. And then when the U.S. Constitution went into effect, the first tariff of 1789 offered some more protection for these people than the New York State legislation that it replaced had. And it was particularly kind to textiles. So with this help of kind of wealthy merchants becoming involved with small craft shops, they transformed into more highly capitalized, mechanized undertakings where skilled labor was gradually replaced by machines and less skilled labor. And then New York City, throughout the 19th century, the garment industry becomes big, ready-made clothing, partly because of New York's position as a transportation hub. Now, in New England, the biggest centers for textile manufacturing emerge not in cities like Boston, but in surrounding areas along rivers like the Merrimack, the Blackstone, and the Connecticut River Valleys. And there, I think New England became big partly because of wealthy merchants looking to diversify their wealth portfolios. These were people that had profited off the Napoleonic Wars. And then when that ended, the textile industry started to seem like a promising investment for them. And so they kind of spread out from Boston and looked along the Merrimack to establish textile manufacturing there. But in general, at first, the average kind of entrepreneurial type was not willing to start them because it didn't seem like a good investment prior to the War of 1812. And then the embargo and the war offered more opportunities because British imports were cut off. And then after British imports resume, and so it's this, again, this kind of halting process of getting people to be interested. But New England becomes associated with the kind of major integrated factory system at Lowell. And that is men who had already made good money on international commerce and then turn to that as just one kind of other source of wealth diversification. A bit earlier in our conversation, you mentioned Eli Whitney. And when scholars of early American manufacturing think of the origins of American textile manufacturing, they can't help but bring up Whitney, who is in our textbooks, is the famed founder of the cotton gin. So, Lindsay, would you tell us more about Eli Whitney and the cotton gin and how the cotton gin led to the development of domestic textile manufacturing? Eli Whitney is this kind of legendary inventor of the cotton gin, even though he made his living mainly making firearms for the federal government. So the cotton gin is a machine that quickly separates fiber from the seed and it makes the production of cotton much more efficient. So he, you know, famously patents this cotton gin in 1794, although recent work by scholars like Angela Laquit have shown that really we attribute too much to Whitney. And there was a lot of work that went into cotton gin from indentured servants and enslaved African in kind of creating this technology. and cotton gins had existed in some form for a very long time before Whitney. But with this kind of 1794 machine that basically uses wire teeth embedded in a wooden roller to pull cotton fiber quickly through a grate, this allowed farmers to grow the more labor-intensive short staple cotton, which had had to be cleaned by hand one plant at a time. And this increases by about 50 times the amount of cotton processed in one day. So although it saved labor, it meant that more cotton could be produced, which led plantation owners to want more slaves and more land to produce this cotton. And then this cotton then fed Britain's and America's textile factory, further kind of linking slavery and industrialization. But again, with more and more cotton produced, the gin makes possible the kind of raw materials being fed into these factories. You mentioned quickly that Eli Whitney is someone we remember for the cotton gin, but in reality, he really made his living and mark in early arms manufacturing. Could you tell us about this less well-known aspect of Eli Whitney's life? Yeah, so... There's all these letters between him and his business partner just basically complaining about the fact that they cannot make any money off the cotton gin. People are using it without paying, you know, the royalties on it. And then when he knows that the government's going to start issuing 
contracts in the 1790s, especially in the context of impending potential war with France during the Quasi War, he is pretty well connected. He knows Decius Wadsworth, who becomes a chief of ordnance. He knows Oliver Wolcott, Secretary of Treasury. And he convinces them that he can basically successfully transition from cotton gins to guns before he even has a factory set up to do so. So he ends up getting the largest of these early contracts. He gets a contract for 10,000 guns, and most of the other people get ones that are like a thousand max. And even though he struggles to get it done, he's allowed to take until I think it's like 1809 to fulfill his obligations. But again, because, you know, he's personally connected, he has a reputation as an inventor, he's able to get these kind of privileged circumstances. And then following the War of 1812, he becomes one of the regular contractors and he had been able to use the kind of advanced sums that were given as part of the contract to open up a gun manufactory in the New Haven, Connecticut area. And that's what he does until he dies and then his son takes over that role. And he's kind of one of the key founders in that area of Connecticut becoming associated with gun manufacturing. And so a lot of the later factories that open in and near New Haven and Hartford, Connecticut, their kind of descendants in some way of Whitney. How typical was Eli Whitney's experience in early American manufacturing? Was it par for the course that these factories to get started by government arms contracts are had by men who just happen to know other men in government? Yeah, to some extent, yes. Personal connections were huge. A few of the other kind of regular contractors like Aza Waters and Simeon North and Nathan Starr in that Connecticut River Valley proximity. At first, the government advertised the need for contractors in the newspapers and people would write in and request these contracts. And they had to be able to prove that they were good for it in some way. And so you had to get recommendation letters from somebody willing to vouch for you and to serve as kind of a surety. And so individuals did need those personal connections. But Whitney is, I think, kind of the most extreme in terms of having no prior experience manufacturing weapons and then getting it almost solely because of these personal connections. And what about the workers who kept these early factories going? We talked a little bit about their experience earlier in our conversation, but could you tell us more about early American workers, you know, about the experiences of someone who might have worked in Eli Whitney's arms factory? The labor that's employed in these factories of the private manufacturers and the Springfield Armory became less skilled over time. A lot of times they were local people that as there were fewer opportunities in farming kind of transitioned into manufacturing work. And so they would write in and oftentimes kind of beg for work and say, oh, I have some skill working. You know, I've done some repairing of farm tools or I've worked in so-and-so's factory before, you know, please hire me. And there were different levels of workers and the skills that they had. And some people employed would show that they had a fair level of skill and had, say, maybe worked in a small manufactory making clocks or something. So that varied. But there was increasingly over this early 19th century period, there's kind of worker dissatisfaction. And you can see that in letters about discipline written by the superintendent of the Springfield Armory. You can see that by kind of petitions sent in requesting either higher wages or mentioning drunkenness from fellow workers or machinery that gets broken, probably because, again, there's workers that are not being treated well and they're finding ways to resist. For the textile workers, so Samuel Slater, you know, one of the kind of fathers of industry was kind of literally a father in terms of employing child labor in his first factories, but he was also putting out to kind of local households. So that might be some, you know, woman that lives in the proximity to Providence and is using that as a way to make extra money for her family. Lowell becomes associated with the kind of Lowell Mill girls and 
they're really keen on avoiding what is seen as the atrocious working conditions of British industrial cities. And so there's this idea that they'll employ kind of moral upstanding Yankee farm girl labor and have these kind of young women move from family farms to the industrial center at Lowell and live in a boarding house. And they're subject to a lot of social control and they, you know, have to go to church and do various things and have curfew. And for some women, that's this great form of independence, but it's also increasingly exploitative. And so these women do begin organizing collectively by the 1830s and trying to get both better conditions and shorter work days. And there are some, I think it's the 1840s in New Hampshire, there's a 10-hour workday law passed, but some of that's difficult to enforce. So in general, the factory conditions become actually increasingly exploitative, especially as places like Lowell tend to come to rely more heavily on immigrant labor with the wave of Irish immigrants that come in the 1840s and the 1850s and this kind of transitioning away from the Yankee mill girl paradigm to immigrant labor that's not treated very well. So we've been having this rather broad conversation about the start of manufacturing in the early United States through the arms and textile industries. And I wonder, when you consider all of the different sources you've looked at, Lindsay, and you place them within the larger context of early American and United States history, how successful do you think Americans were in building thriving textile and arms factories? And how do you think we should measure this success? What are the markers for success? So they are successful eventually. And for the nation's first several decades, they're still looking at Britain as the model. They're still looking at the French as models. But by the 1820s, Britain's actually sending over individuals to observe what's going on at the Springfield Armory because they are increasingly recognizing that the Americans are producing the technology to compete with them. And that by the famous Crystal Palace exhibition, the International Fair in 1851, Americans are winning all sorts of prizes for various manufactured goods, including some textiles and including Samuel Colt's revolvers. So by then, the United States is seen as quite successful, but, you know, it's a long process. In the case of the arms industry, it's success, definitely being able to be self-sufficient in production. And by the War of 1812, the United States is. And that, I think, is a remarkable achievement on the part of the federal government. It created a firearms industry, and that firearms industry then went to work for it when it fought against Great Britain. The process of being self-sufficient in textiles is again, a longer process and Americans continue to like their kind of fancy goods from overseas. But by the 1820s, federal officials are writing about the ability to use American textiles basically to provide some of the supplies for consumers. And one way that Americans measure this is by comparing their sales abroad to, say, Great Britain. And some manufacturers are very proud to note that there are places in the newly independent Latin American nations that are starting to prefer U.S. goods to British goods in the 1820s. So that's kind of another measure of success. But they will continue to like certain materials from overseas. But I think also when the United States becomes more militarily secure, it's less of a threat if, again, Americans do want to be wearing a shirt made in Britain or importing fancy dishes from France. That's less of a threat when, again, the United States becomes more militarily independent. Before we move into the time warp, I am curious about something. Lindsay notes in her book, Manufacturing Advantage, that the stories of the firearms and textile industries are not something that are usually talked about and told together in a single history book. And yet, Lindsay did make this choice to place the stories of these two very different industries side by side in her history of early American manufacturing. So, Lindsay, would you tell us why you decided to look at the development of both the American textile and firearms industry in your history book? And 
what you think we can learn about the history of early manufacturing by looking at the stories of these two very different industries? Yeah. So the choice to focus on arms and textiles took me a while to get to. So this project actually emerged out of an article that I had written on the relationship between a group of Boston merchant industrialists, so the people responsible for the factories in Lowell, Massachusetts, and the transcontinental treaty with Spain by which the United States acquires Florida. So I started paying attention to the shipping claims that these merchant industrialists had gotten as a result of the treaty with Spain because the United States assumes the payment of claims that merchants had against the Spanish government for kind of lax policing or shipping depredations that happened in their waters. And so this key group gets, I think, a disproportionate chunk of federal funds as a result. And it's conveniently timed with their factory development at Lowell. So I was wondering, okay, so here's this interesting way that they're benefiting from the federal government, even though they're considered these entrepreneurial and independent individuals. And so I wanted to see the other ways they benefited from state support, whether direct or indirect. I was also interested at the time in U.S. South American trade. And so I started looking at diplomatic papers, especially consular dispatches, which are all these letters, pamphlets, trade statistics that U.S. consular agents sent back to the State Department from their various posts in Latin American ports. And so I start seeing manufacturing goods show up in those records. I also saw several references to arms imports into South America from the United States. And I thought, well, that's interesting. The United States is supposedly neutral at this time, and Latin America was in the midst of independence wars against Spain and Portugal. But I had no plans at that point to study, say, how firearms manufacturing developed. But soon after that, someone had mentioned to me that there was lots of industrial innovation happening in the arms industry at Springfield, Massachusetts. And again, I had no specific plans to study arms, but I ended up going to the New England branch of the National Archives and looking at the records of the Springfield Armory. And on my very first day there, I saw several mentions of arms sales to Buenos Aires, which was fantastic. Of course, that didn't happen again because the government wasn't supposed to be involved in sending firearms to the Latin American countries that were in rebellion. But basically, the more that I read of these Springfield Armory records, the more I became interested in the fact that all of these private gun contractors were writing and basically were totally dependent on government patronage. So despite the, you know, right to bear arms in the United States, there wasn't enough civilian demand to create a really large arms industry. So that became really interesting to me. And I was still, again, thinking about textiles and these Boston associates and how to talk about them together. And of course, with textiles, as I said, there would be a market regardless of if the government was involved. But the precise ways in which the industry developed and certain people like the Boston Associates were becoming kind of privileged, this did depend on government policies. And so then when I began to think in terms of national security, it started to make sense. Then this idea that, again, the early national period was kind of fraught with anxieties over whether the new nation would survive. Industry offered kind of one solution. So even though, again, the stories of arms and textile industries are usually not told together, I think in a single narrative, they emerge as products of national security. So what you're saying is, if we really want to understand the history of manufacturing and how it got its start in the early United States, then we really ought to look at textile and firearms manufacturing together. Yes. And also because those are the two industries that become kind of the hallmarks of industry. And even though, again, they're not usually told in the same story, that is what the United States becomes associated with in terms of both the firearms industry becoming premier in the world by the 1850s and then the kind of lull integrated factory system becoming internationally recognized also before 1850, that seeing how those two industries emerge as what the United States becomes famous for if we put them in the story of national security 
it makes sense that it's not just one of kind of entrepreneurial individuals working on their own to make this happen, that they emerge as a larger process of government intervention in making this possible. Now we should jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened to the development of Americans' armament and textile industries had the United States government never become involved in them after the revolution? How might the course of American manufacturing in United States history be different? As I said earlier, historians have debated how much tariffs help. So if they had never issued, say, protective tariffs on textiles, I think it would have taken longer for the textile industry to develop, but I think it would have developed eventually over time, even without, again, tariffs or patents or incorporation laws or even diplomacy. But it again, it would have taken longer. The arms industry, though, I mean, just the fact that there, again, there's all these letters from these arms contractors and they're writing back and they're saying, if you don't continue to support us, like, that's it. My livelihood is done. I will have to close up shop. And to the extent that the arms industry developed on the scale that it did, that was definitely dependent on government capital and the need to, you know, state sanctioned violence is important for the firearms industry. If there's no war, then there's not as much need for guns. But the fact that the United States is constantly involved in some form of warfare, whether that be a declared war against Great Britain or against Mexico, or just kind of endless frontier warfare. That's what's fueling the development of the firearms industry. So what's next for you, Lindsay? Are you researching and writing something new? So I'm currently working on a biographical study of Joel Roberts Poinsett, who was a secret agent in South America. He's our first ambassador to Mexico. He's also South Carolina state legislator, U.S. congressman, and he's secretary of war in the late 1830s and is one of the individuals tasked with carrying out Indian removal. And he's also one of the kind of key foundational figures in starting the Smithsonian Institute in the 1840s. And so I see him as kind of the perfect guide to understanding military, economic, and political development in the early Republic. And where's the best place to reach you with our questions about early American manufacturing? So email, please, which can be found on my faculty page at Miami University. Embarrassingly, I don't tweet. So yes, email is the best way. Thank you. Lindsay Schackenbach Regula, thank you for taking us through the history and development of manufacturing in the early United States. Thanks so much. I enjoy this conversation very much. The War for American Independence lasted eight long years. At the end of the war, an estimated 25,000 Americans had lost their lives, and independence had been secured. But after Great Britain acknowledged American independence in the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the question arose, how long would an independent United States last? As Lindsay revealed, this question undergirded the movement to develop American factories and manufacturing. If the United States was to function and be seen as an independent nation, then it needed to be independent of foreign manufacturers. Producing firearms to protect itself, wage war, and expand the territorial bounds of the nation was seen as a matter of prime importance and as a matter of national security, as was the nation's ability to produce its own textiles, cloth and fabric products that could be used in times of war, but also in times of peace. Like firearms, American-produced textiles were a symbol of the United States' independence. So to show to itself and the world that the United States was indeed an independent nation, the United States government invested in manufacturing. In the case of firearms, as Lindsay related, the government made significant capital investments in federal armories and in arms contractors like Eli Whitney. In the case of textile manufacturing, 
The government supported entrepreneurial and would-be factory owners and investors by passing protective tariffs, which would make American-made cloth cheaper than imported European cloth. And as these textile and arm factories developed, they eventually spurred the growth of the American economy and the creation of other industries. A prime example of this is how textile manufacturing helped give birth to the southern cotton boom of the 1840s and 1850s. But more than helping the United States economy grow, manufacturing arms and being self-reliant when it came to the production of textiles made it easier for the United States to remain an independent and sovereign nation. You can find more information about Lindsay, her book, Manufacturing Advantage, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 298. If you'd like to have the notes, links, and all the information about our episode guests conveniently in your inbox, be sure you sign up for the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter. Sign up at benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what early American industries interest you? I'm always interested to find out what interests you, so please send me your answers. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahandro Institute.